Welcome to the Come Follow Me Made Easier podcast. I'm your host, Linda Cherry, and today I am joined by my co-teacher, Sam Castor, the author of the book, Zion Rising. You can find out more about Sam's book by going to his website, by zionrising.com. All right, great. This week, we're going to be talking about Joshua, who had quite a daunting task, and it's been a great experience for me to study about Joshua in preparation, because I thought I knew about him, but there were a few details that were missing from my memory, starting with the fact that Joshua is recorded as being a minister to Moses during that incredible encounter at Mount Sinai in uh, Exodus 24. And in fact, he's one of the 70 that get to go up and see the Lord. Sam, you probably remembered that about Joshua, didn't you? Yeah, that's wonderful. He's part of that, that uh, preliminary school of the prophets, so to speak, which is really what that I think that 70 was, was let's take what Moses had received and expand it outward to more and, and, and fill the world. Remember how Moses said he wished all the world were prophets and prophetesses? Right. right. Well, it seems like as if Joshua never falters. In fact, I shared with you a few weeks ago that my favorite scripture that led me to finding a prophet on the earth today was Exodus 33, 11. And in that very same verse, it says that after Moses departed, Joshua stayed in the tabernacle, which also really tells us that he had a really close relationship with the Lord. Joshua really knew the Lord, and I can't help but feel that he was being prepared for his mission in every bit as much as Abraham or Moses were. We just don't have a Pearl of Great Price that tells us about Joshua's call. I wish we did. Another interesting thing about Joshua is that his name is the same name as Jesus. It is Yeshua, and that is the way that his mother would have addressed him. And so at this time, as I was reading and studying about Joshua, I was trying to look for all the various ways that he was like the Savior, because we see that the best of our prophets and our leaders, both male and female, they are striving to be Christ-like, and they are so often examples to us of the Savior and help lead us to the Savior. And and we can really see that in Joshua's life, beginning even with his name. When we first start in the book of Joshua, that 40 years has gone by where the older generation was supposed to basically die off. It was hard, wasn't it? I mean, they just were so rebellious and it's just so interesting that we don't, we just don't see big changes on their part. That 40 year period of time is hard for me when I read it, because I just want to say, please just change your hearts. But we see that, in fact, they, uh, they just don't seem to make those big changes. In fact, it's really illustrated for me in the fact that before they go into the promised land, the Lord instructs Joshua that all the males have to be circumcised. In other words, that they have not since leaving Egypt, they haven't kept that token of the covenant that sets them apart and distinguishes them as a covenant family. So that 40 years has gone by. We talked last time about how it had to be sort of a relief for Moses to actually be able to say goodbye at this point. And he is translated, taken to God. And we see Moses again on the Mount of Transfiguration and then in the Kirtland Temple. But what a burden of responsibility on Joshua, who had been with the people all of this time, had learned directly from the Lord, and had learned from Moses about what it meant to be a prophet and to specifically lead and guide these people. And we see almost everything that Joshua does. We can tell that he is fulfilling to the very letter the instructions that Moses has given him. We see that in the distribution of land for the tribes, that it's literally exactly as Moses had told him it should be. And and, and it's really touching to me when I think about him as this young man, thinking of Moses being more than 80 years old, we know when he went up the mountain with the children of Israel, with the tablets and so on. And I just sort of picture in my mind when it says that Joshua was his minister, that kind of pictured Joshua kind of helping Moses along and being an arm to lean on and, yeah. you know, just a, a humble kind of person. And, he, and I think he also did it with enthusiasm, uh, with, with not only with, with faith. I think sometimes we we incorrectly associate that type of faith or that type of commitment or dedication or <clears throat> a complete removal of self, like he he was in dividing up the land for to borrow your example and just pointing to what Moses had dictated. That idea of just being a conduit. I think sometimes we think that that means that we don't 
get to have enthusiasm or we don't get to have optimism or gratitude or personality or emotion. And I think when, when Joshua and it was Caleb who came back and encouraged the Israelites to have faith after they had been, after Joshua and Caleb and others had been spies uh, to go look at the land. I think I envision Joshua as someone who's like, not only courageous and faithful, but enthusiastic. And the true meaning of that word, meaning entheastic or in Latin meaning having God within you. I, I believe Joshua was the kind of person that was like, hey, this is awesome. Why aren't we grateful? Why aren't we happy? Why aren't we enthused about this, this opportunity and these blessings? I feel like that he was that kind of energy. I totally agree with you. And in fact, I want to kind of focus on that for a few minutes because we also know that he's a good warrior. When he goes into the land, he's leading the armies. So I agree with you that he was full of that enthusiasm. And it's interesting to me because another word I would have used to describe him specifically when he is sent as one of the 12 spies to spy out the land is that he is not easily discouraged. Mm -hmm. In other words, while the others are saying there's giants in the land and the land is full of people, and then also that the people are constantly murmuring and complaining, and he knows he's the next leader. Uh, I don't ever see him getting discouraged, which is interesting to me because the Lord in his call to Joshua three times repeats, be strong and of a good courage. What do you think of that? I love it. And it's interesting with the numbers again, 40 years, the four being representative of earth life. But then Christ saying, elevate yourself up, Joshua, three times, be strong and be of good courage, that <clears throat> we create so much with our own hearts. We, we influence so much around us, not only the energy of other people around us, but also the very experiences we have, the, the matter around us is influenced by that positivity. And you can see it, you can feel it. I think someone who is very positive like that or strong and of, cur of good courage was President Hinckley and, and you know President Monson and President Nelson, obviously. But President Hinckley, I think, uh, typified this, this idea of it's going to work out. This is going to be great. <laughs> There's no reason to, to be discouraged, be grateful, be excited because God's in charge. And I, <clears throat> when, when you have that kind of energy, it's contagious. It, uh, it allows for miracles to happen. It allows us to expect miracles like President Nelson just counseled us to expect. And when they come, it's like Christmas every time there's a miracle. <laughs> it's so that. awesome. Yeah, I love that. And you can tell that in Joshua's character. When we were talking earlier about that, he's in many ways a type of Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, Joshua's determination and courage reminds me of a verse in Isaiah that says that uh, the Messiah would set his face like a flint towards fulfilling his mission. And we really see that in Jesus when he is on his way to his last week in Jerusalem. And he tells his disciples just straight up, I'm going to die. And they try to dissuade him. But just as had been prophesied by Isaiah, he set his face as a flint. He was going to perform that mission. And I sense the same thing from Joshua. At this point, after all of these years, nothing is dissuading him from fulfilling the word and will of the Lord. And it's such an incredible contrast, isn't it? I love that you bring this up, Linda, because this, the, the real, I, I believe the real issue that the Israelites were struggling with, and it's something that I've struggled in, with in my life, I think all of us struggle with it, is when things don't work out the way we expected them to, it's easy to go into, just like Laman and Lemuel did, it's easy to go into victim. It's easy to go into what was me ideas and thoughts, and <clears throat> you start to become like this black hole. Uh, and we've, I, I know we've all done it. We've all been a little bit of like, like the Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh or <laughs> Layman and Lemuel's brother or as brothers of Nephi, where we actually start to, we self-fulfill our own prophecies of doom and gloom. You know, we horribleize things right. and to get rid of that energy to, to, instead of looking at the, at the darkness and only seeing darkness, Joshua is saying, you know, Christ is here to help us turn that darkness into light. He's here to help us turn these afflictions into bread and adversity into water. It's, it's actually meant to help us soar, just like we need the wind underneath us to, to bring an airplane up, right? Like there's, that opposition is so valuable. It's, it's, it's part of the gift. Yeah. And so getting to that mindset, I think is <clears throat> one of the things that the Lord is trying to help us see how he did it with Joshua. And I love that in what you and I were talking about earlier, that Joshua was counseled not only to be strong and of good courage, but the way he does that is to internalize the word of the Lord, to read every day, 
to be engaged and, and literally invite the Lord's spirit and enthusiasm and, and light into him, his word into him so it can buoy him up even when he's surrounded by that darkness. That's right. It made me think, I've been thinking for weeks, Sam, about your experiment with the rice. And I've actually listened a number of times because you really had an emphasis on the song of redeeming love, mm -hmm. the idea of frequency, that Christ is singing that song of redeeming love to us. And that when we sort of tune into that frequency, which Joshua did by reading the scriptures day and night, that was the one tool the Lord gave him that the Lord repeated to him, this is the way you will be strong and have a good courage. I was thinking about how then that reading of the scriptures relates to the song of redeeming love and the frequency you, you talked about, about when we speak the word, when we receive the word that you, I want you to know that's really been planted deep in my heart. And I've just been really noticing it all around me. And then being more aware of what feel like negative frequencies or negative words and kind of keeping myself apart from that and looking for that positive to reinforce going forward. Thank you so much for saying that. I, I, I've, I always walk away with something like that in our discussions as well. You see things that I don't see and it's, so, it's just so edifying. I think that's the beauty of a chorus, right? Of us all singing. We all see these different uh, elements of who the savior is. You know, it's funny, I have a brother who's a musician we all sing. My, my father sang in the Young Ambassadors at BYU, and he, he actually played, uh, he was the, he played the role of Lucifer in My Turn on Earth, because wow. <laughs> he had a good wow. deep voice, which is fun. And I have a brother who still sings, who is one of my dearest friends. He's such a sweet guy, and he can sing five, I think it's something like four or five octaves. He can go up and down. Wow. Incredible. But the, he talks a lot about that too. We've had many discussions about this idea of frequency and how what we're really trying to do is we're trying to elevate ourselves to that higher level. And I have found, Linda, that there's so much power in this. And anybody who's listening, I hope to hear this. The, the prophet keeps counseling us to be on the covenant path. And in many respects, that's similar to this idea of frequency. The world talks about frequencies manifesting. They're, they're copying all this stuff from the gospel, right? right. It, it's just uh, like how Paul says, we look through a, a, a glass darkly. Like we don't fully see ourselves. We're learning things. That's kind of how the world sees a lot of gospel stuff sometimes. But <clears throat> staying on the covenant path means that we keep those covenants that we made in the temple. Like, you know, how Josh was trying to help the Israelites obey the, the commandments of the Lord. But there's so much power in personal covenants as well in making these promises with the Lord where we just, I, I feel like this is what Joshua did with the Lord is the Lord was like, you will have courage. You will have strength. You will overcome if you read every day. And the simplicity of that covenant is something that we can replicate in every single one of our lives. If, if we go to the Lord and we say, I want this, I want a better job. I want a better relationship with my kids. I want I don't know. I may not get my hair back for a while. I want my hair back. <laughs> you know? um, I want, I want to be able to see your face. I, I want to be able to have peace, even though I'm dealing with this stress, whatever it is, especially in, in these world conflicts, <clears throat> we can go to the Lord and we can make a covenant. And one of the simplest covenants we can make is that we will read his word and pray and seek him every day. Doing that consistently changes us. It makes us more like him. It gives us strength and courage. It gives us the blessings that we're seeking for. And I have, I've had so many examples in my life where I've seen miracles happen by just that simple, consistent covenant keeping and, and being able to make our own personal covenants is something the Lord wants us to do. He wants us to magnify our own talents. He wants us to come to him and tailor out our lives with him. Any chance I can, I try and invite people to do that because we need people to be themselves. We need them to exemplify their gifts. We need them to show who they really are because the world is dark and we need as much light as we can get. We need to be able to just radiate that light that we get from him through these covenants that we can make with him. So, And I'm so grateful that you're emphasizing that because I feel like one of the main things that we need to take away from the Old Testament, that first of all, Joseph Smith changed the name Testament in the scriptures to covenant. Yeah. And, you know, we think of the Old Testament, we automatically think it's dusty and put it on the shelf. But, the, but I appreciate your bringing us back to the fact and the emphasis that really what this Old Testament book is teaching us is about the original covenant makers and the gifts and blessings of covenant keeping, as well as the sorrows and consequences that come from covenant breaking. And that this is the same new and everlasting covenant given to Adam and Eve that they longed for, for us, according to Doctrine and Covenants 107, that at the very end of his life, 
Adam stood up and prophesied, and he prophesied to the very last of his generations. That means us. What he was hoping, what he was asking is that we might be able to come into the presence of God and be able to receive all of these exact same blessings that Joshua and before him Moses and before him Abraham were trying to urge their people to be able to receive. And one of the things that happens here in the book of Joshua are the signs of the covenant or tokens of covenant making. So as you pointed out this, we can make our own covenants with the Lord in addition to the covenants that we make at baptism and in the temple. And when we are baptized, when we're in the temple, there are certain signs or tokens that kind of remind us of the covenants that we have made. And maybe you have used some other little signs or tokens for yourself to remind you of, of tokens you have made. But one of the things that the Lord wanted the people here to do before they went into the promised land, and just as an aside, the promised land, the land he promised them, that despite all of the complaining and arguing and challenges, he's going to keep his promise, that the Lord asked the people to fulfill the promise that Abraham had made in their behalf, that they would be circumcised as a sign or token of the covenant. Um, in fact, to Abraham, that instruction had been given that that should go on throughout the generations and that the Lord would see that as a sign. These are his people. Now, another part of that sign is implied in Exodus 19, 5 and 6, when the Lord says, if you'll keep my commandments or my covenant, you'll be to me a peculiar people. And we often think of peculiar as strange or weird, but in fact, it means something like you are my one and only, you are a treasure to me, you're my guarded treasure. And in fact, the Lord uses it in terms of a bridegroom to his bride, because only that degree of intimacy could express the deep love he has for his people when he's calling them peculiar unto himself. And so one of the things that makes us peculiar or set apart are these signs or tokens of the covenant. In the ancient world, that was the circumcision. In our day, it might be the clothing that we're wearing that can set us apart as having made covenants with the Lord and that we remember and cherish those covenants. And so I can only imagine how difficult it was, Sam, for all of these men because they'd been wandering for 40 years. And by the way, some people put little comments down below our, our presentation. And I want to point out that when we share things, often they are from the Old Testament student manual, that great CES Institute manual. And the Institute manual suggests that, in fact, there had been no circumcisions this whole time. So we have people that might be as old as 40 who are now going to be circumcised. But again, just remembering they're setting themselves apart unto God as a covenant people, because they're about to go into a land of idol worshipers and people who actually still also mark themselves as belonging to their idols. This might be a form of tattoo or also cutting of the flesh in other areas to set themselves apart as belonging to those idols. And so this is a physical manifestation of an inward commitment to their covenant. Amen. Well, and I, you know, this is, I love that you have such depth of knowledge on this, Linda, because of your, your book, Redemption of the Bride, which <clears throat> highlights this idea that the Lord is trying to help us become his and, and that, that intimacy and that connection. I love that. And one, one of the outward symbols of an inward commitment, just in the symbol of, of marriage is a wedding ring, right? Mm -hmm. This idea of a band, having that circle around our finger tells the world I'm committed. I'm, I'm connected to someone else. And that circle of circumcision is a similar idea, but there's also a this deeper commitment that is manifest by sacrifice, by consecration, where you're literally cutting away, removing away what the world would say is valuable. You know, if, I, if I'm deciding to get married, I'm not going to go be promiscuous. I'm not going to go have multiple relationships. I'm committed to my wife who I love. And I'm, that's where I'm at, that, that I've let go of those worldly things. And like you said earlier, it's like how Adam and Eve, when the Lord made those covenants with them, he was basically saying, you're fallen, you're down here, and I can help you come back. You just have to let go. <laughs> you have to let go of the stuff that's down there because it's going to trap you unless you let it go. But in letting it go, you prove your divinity. In sacrificing, you prove your commitment to holiness. And 
and you know dividing your away or pushing away that that dust like we talked about last time then i'll make room for you to receive the gold and there's something beautiful about that commitment and can you imagine these 40 year old guys no. getting circumcised <laughs> in pain in the desert yeah. in the yeah. desert yes no antiseptics no antiseptics. Well, <laughs> yes. yeah or maybe something but that didn't work very well yes. <laughs> when abraham was circumcised how how quickly did the angels come almost immediately right the next day if yeah. there's anything in our life that we need to cut out, that we need to remove, it, that that's the invitation is let it go so I can open your heart to receive what I want to give you. It's beautiful. Thank you for pointing that out. Later, Ezekiel will say, really what I want or what the Lord wants is for us to cut away or circumcise our heart, yes. cut away from our heart, anything that's in the way of blocking our relationship with him. Now, I do want to mention that I think that another interesting symbol of the circumcision is, as you've already pointed out, your commitment to your wife. One of the beautiful promises of the covenant is eternal seed, eternal increase. And I think that this is a very visible symbol of helping, I would think, to keep the law of chastity with this sense of, because of the covenant, we're an eternal family. And because of the covenant, our children will be with us for eternity. And in fact, we will have children on the other side. I mean, what an incredible thing and how different than most Christians believe or picture the afterlife to be. But this sense that we can consistently and constantly be progressing, learning, and even having families is, is an incredible blessing. So again, just like your wedding ring, this sign of the circumcision was this promise of all that's inherent in the covenant blessing. So Love that. I love that. And it's all, I also want to be super sensitive too to anybody who, who wants to be married or who has been married and is not. I think that's what's beautiful about this is that Christ is saying, I will give you everything. Yeah. If you have a wound over that, if you have a heartache or, or, or loss or, you know, pain or whatever it is, but, but <clears throat> the Lord is saying that he knows that and that he's, and he, and he's assuring us that he will, he will give us more than we and we can ever possibly imagine that the, the bounty is, is just waiting for us. Thank you for bringing that up. And it makes me feel like there perhaps is someone who's going to be hearing that. So I want to add my testimony to yours. I have been sealed in the temple and I'm currently divor divorced. And I have absolute assurance and faith in the gift and blessings of the priesthood. And that I have those blessings available to me. I believe that I am sealed to Heavenly Father's family. I'm sealed into the family of Israel. And I trust in the blessings of the Lord that there won't be anything that's denied to me. And I take tremendous comfort from that and believe it with all of my heart. So thank you for even bringing that up because it is important to share that. It's, it's so sad, you know, every once in a while, probably at my own peril, I connect with people on Facebook and talk about <laughs> religious things. And I have a lot of friends who grew up in Provo, who are no longer members of the church. Uh, but I get a lot of really valuable feedback from them about pain or, or heartache or things that they're struggling with. And that that is a painful reality, right? There's a lot of people that have, yeah. and, I, and I, like, for example, in your situation, I'm sorry that, that that's the situation. You're, you're marvelous and it's it's sad. And I, have, I, I think you're exemplifying this, be, be of good courage and be strong like Joshua. Like, you know that the blessings are still there. You're still connected. And the Lord has your back. It's, it's, it's sad. And there's so much hope. Yeah. Something I learned through the process, and I don't want to detour too much, is that I'd had this feeling in my life that there's always just a plan A. There's no such thing as a plan B. And that in fact, if plan A fails, then basically you failed. So I this, this was one of my greatest learning experiences in my life. It was very difficult, by far the most difficult thing I've experienced. But I really learned firsthand how much the Lord is with us in creating a beautiful life. And I've thought so often about the scripture where Jesus said, I have come that they might have life and that more abundantly. And so I realized in my own journey that he wanted to give me an abundant life. And the only thing that was really kind of holding that off was me and my feelings either of I don't deserve it or my, my inability to see that he was offering me something and embrace it. And so I do, I, I do definitely know there's, there are many plans, but that the Lord does create those lives, those plan B's or C's or whatever they are 
I know that he, he creates them with us. And it's not like a consolation prize. The Lord wants us to have joy, just like uh, Lehi taught us. And I, I know that for myself. And so I'm grateful. So to return to Joshua. Well, when we're I have to piggyback off of that for one second. <laughs> Adam and Eve. Remember, uh, God is yep. counseling and he's like, hey, if, if they eat the fruit, then plan B is Christ. And, and this, this symbolism of Joshua really? and Moses and these 70 and, you know, Moses is trying to get everyone to come up the mountain. Right. I think sometimes, that, at least in my pers perspective and experience, because I've been with, there with you, I've had lots of plan Bs. And uh, lots of awesome plan A's that have worked, but a, a lot of plan B's that are disappointing and discouraging. And I think sometimes we think that the Lord is only at the top of the mountain. Oh, and yes. We have, we have to get up to the top to be able to see him. But I know he is in the valley. You know, Sam, I had an experience just before my divorce occurred where it was like this little sort of mini dream. I, I, I'm not sure I want to call it a vision, but it sort of was. I was awake. I haven't had an experience like that before. But suddenly I just saw myself falling and I saw myself falling into this deep, very deep cavernous, dark pit. And the fall was long, 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 long. And just before I was about to hit the bottom, I felt the savior catch me. And he put his arms around me. His chest was to my back and his arms were, were around me. And my first thought was, wait, you're not supposed to be down here. You're supposed to be up top. And I heard him whisper in my ear, we are going to be down here for a very long time, but I will be with you. And it was such a powerful experience for me. As I mentioned, it happened just before the, the news of what was going to happen with my divorce. And I took tremendous comfort from it the whole time, because I'll be honest with you, I was in that pit for a very long time. But I did know that the Savior was there. And I learned so much because I did always think he should be at the top and pull me out. But I learned so much more by having him be in the pit with me and, and, and come slowly out of the pit with me. I learned so much more to have that deep relationship. I can only, thank you for sharing that. I can only, I can only imagine he is in the pit and, and he understands it. He, in fact, I think sometimes... He's because he understands, because he stood under, he descended below all things. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I believe that he's there more often. And, and he's in the, he's in the broken, he's in the wound, he's in the sorrow. And, and if we're willing to see him and recognize that he's right there, feeling it with us and that he's right there to help it not become a permanent scar or a, a, a permanent type of damnation to our progression. That's the beauty of the savior. He overcomes, he, like he always says, <clears throat> our, our walls are continually before him. Yeah, he breaks through those walls. <laughs> he he helps us if we're willing to receive him. And thank you, thank you for sharing that. That's very tender. Well, kind of illustrating this point and underscoring it for the Israelites that the Savior was with them. It's just before they went into the Promised Land, they um, were to have Passover. They were to celebrate Passover. Now I want to talk about that for a moment because. I've written a second book called The Feasts and Festivals of the Messiah. Mm -hmm. And I think that we, as Christians, we have kind of overlooked those ancient feast days and how they prophesied and testified of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And it was the Passover that the Savior used as his last supper. And he used the emblems of the Passover, the bread and wine, which are central emblems of the Passover. He used those to institute the sacrament. And since that time, then we have that opportunity of renewing our covenants through partaking of the sacrament every week. But going back to the sense that now just before they're to enter the promised land, uh, they're to take to partake of Passover. Can I also add a lot of people call Passover or tabernacles Jewish holidays. They were given to all of the Israelites. And in fact, there was a commandment they were to keep them till the end of time. Ezekiel prophesies we will take we will partake of Passover in the millennium, and Zechariah prophesies that we will all celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles in the in the millennium. So uh, it's it's helpful to kind of look at those symbols, and we know how powerful that first Passover in Egypt was. This promise of deliverance for them as they came through their bloody doorposts, and then they come through the Red Sea with the baptism, and then they have the fire of the pillar of fire that led them um, to 
to Mount Sinai where they were going to have this personal encounter with the Lord. And now before they're about to go into the promised land, they're going to have another very similar experience to that in that now they're going to remember the Passover. They're going to recite as most Israelites did as the Passover scripts have changed and, and they're very different from household to household, according to the beliefs of the people. But one thing that is fairly consistent that is found in most of the old Haggadah uh, scripts is that there's a portion of the Passover ritual where everyone chants, by the blood of the lamb were we saved. By the blood of the lamb was death made to pass over. It's just so powerful when you think about everyone united chanting this. Now, did the Israelites do that? I don't know, but I do know that it was part of the ancient ritual for Passover, a very specific script that was that was followed. So it pictured them remembering the blood of the lamb that would enable them to become free from Egypt. And now they're going to be partaking of the, the unleavened bread and the wine as part of the Passover ritual, the bitter herbs, as had been instructed to them, their, their sons are going to stand up and ask them very specific questions. One of those questions, and in fact, the very first question that's supposed to be asked in the Passover ritual is, what distinguished this this night from any other night? Or in other words, what makes this night different than any other night? So I want us to think about all of the different Passovers we have recorded in scripture. So I want us to think about the very first Passover. What made that night different than any other night? The Israelites had to exercise incredible faith to um, put the lamb's blood over the door, but also to be dressed and ready to leave, knowing that Pharaoh had all of these armies that could quickly recapture them. And then the, the next time this Passover that's recorded here with Joshua and someone asking that question, if they're following the ritual, what makes this night different than any other night? The next day, they were not going to have manna. The, with the Passover, manna ended. And then they were going to eat the fruit of the land of Canaan. And so this great miracle they'd had of the bread from heaven is now going to end. What makes this night different than any other night as they're about to now cross the Jordan River. And I'll let you share that story in a minute. Then we go to Jesus at the Passover. And it's believed by many, many scholars. My favorite one is Alfred Edersheim, a Jew who became a Christian and has recorded many of the ancient traditions for us and how they are exemplified in Christ. And in fact, um, both Elder McConkie and Elder Talmadge quote Alfred Edersheim extensively. But many scholars, in addition to Edersheim, say that they believe that John, as the youngest apostle, would have stood up and asked that question that night. What makes this night different than any other night? Well, that night was going to be the fulfillment of all of those Passover promises that the Lamb of God was going to give us life and atone for us that death would pass over his people. It's just kind of um, always constantly inspiring. Sorry for the emotion. It, it always works that way on me. So I think about I think about the sort of anticipation in each of those Passovers, including this one with the Israelites about to make their way into Israel, that they keep the Passover. And with that Passover, even as we renew our covenants with the sacrament, I believe that they were renewing their covenant through the ritual of the Passover before they go into the land. Beautiful, and I love that. And and there's just like the ring, God's one eternal round. He has bookends to things. The symbolism continues; it rolls forward. And when Joshua parts the river so they can cross their own dry land, there's so uh, McConkie once said the best symbols. I think it was his son Joseph said the best symbols don't end right they, or they, they continue to have depth and the symbolism of that dividing being tied to when abraham cut the animals in half and walked through that cut to that that separation the red sea joshua the mount of olives when christ comes again and divides the mount of olives to, to liberate the jews in the last uh, final uh, redemption through the, the messiah gate the, all of this symbolism is continually reminding us back to what we talked about at the beginning that the lord is saying let go let me cut out. Let me, let me make a, co a covenant or a cutting. It has the same root word in Hebrew. 
and show you that I will bring you through the wound. I will bring you like, like your beautiful story. I'll bring you out of the dark valley up to the peak. And <clears throat> he does it again with that river. And I, 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 I hope people take just a minute to think about this, like what this really would have looked like or what the Red Sea really would have looked like or what the Mount of all, like imagine, uh, imagine that experience where this thing that's supposed to be powerful and immovable divides, separates, the river stops, the, the oceans, the, you know, parted and opened up. There, there's something so powerful about this. And of course, the God who created the heaven and the earth, the God who has done these mighty miracles, of course, he's going to do something glorious like this for those that are willing to believe him, that, that are willing to keep the Passover, for those that are willing to expect a miracle. His miracles are awesome. <laughs> I just think it's such a cool thing to just sit and think about. Imagine a river parting. Imagine the ocean parting. It's just it's such a powerful demonstration of how much he loves us and how he, he really literally will, will move heaven and earth to reunite us, to bring us back. In fact, when you think about even today, people consider Moses the greatest prophet. And in fact, even the prophecy about Jesus Christ was that, that the Lord would bring up a prophet like unto Moses, that what a challenge it would have been for Joshua to now take the lead and the Lord promised Joseph, or promised Joshua, I'm going to magnify you in the sight of the people. And it was through this specific miracle of the parting of the Jordan River. But let's talk about, you know, what that looked like, because the, the position of the ark and the priests being in the very front, I think was also deeply symbolic. What are your thoughts about that? There's so many layers with any symbol, right? It's a powerful symbol, but like we were talking about earlier, let the word lead. Let, let his command, his law lead. Yeah. And we live in a time where there's so many people who want to have love lead. Love is love and we should just love everybody. And, you know, but we, it's, we forget, we forget the importance of the law. We for, I, I often think if I can make another silly analogy that life is kind of, if we, if we lean too heavily on love and not rely on the law, what we're doing is Imagine being in a, in a stadium full of fans who are adoring and cheering and, and rooting on a team. And then we look down at the game and there's no game. <laughs> <laughs> because the, the, without laws, without boundaries, without rules, yeah. how do you have a competition? How do you, you know, how do you have a game? And the reality is there are rules, there are laws, there are boundaries. And God is trying to tell us how to follow them so we can return, how to follow them so we can win and, and earn points and have fun and have joy, have the, that feeling of conquering and, and becoming like him. And the, and the other reality is we're all on the same team, right? And, and we can realize that when we, have, when we have his law, his word in our hearts and in our minds leading us in our paths. I really like that visual, especially because they are going into a land that is inhabited and not only inhabited, but big cities like Jericho oh, yeah. and, and that the ark is playing such an important role, even in the fall of Jericho's walls of circling Jericho mm -hmm. once each day for seven days. And then seven times on the seventh day mm -hmm. with the priests blowing their trumpets, but the point is being made. They are not entering in this land by their own might. And in fact, every time they try to conquer the others by their own might and power, they fail. But that the only way they're going to be able to enter into this land is by the will and might of the Lord, the power of the Lord. Back to your lesson that we had a few weeks ago about the power of the word, that Moses was instructed to use the word. And the word is in the ark. I love, I love that. And so that it's illustrating to the inhabitants of the land, as well as to the Israelites, None of this happens unless we're a covenant people keeping our covenant and unless it's the will of the Lord and the Lord does it for us. And so I think it's really powerful in regard to, to Jericho specifically. I don't know if you've ever been, I've been to Jericho and it's such an interesting thing because it was such a powerful city and, and so important for this sort of we, uh, weaponless, uh, warless, battleless city to fall for setting the tone for what all the rest of the people are going to end up thinking, including sweet Ray Harlot, who said that the spirit had told her that these people were led by the Lord and that they were going to take Jericho and they were going to take the city. 
So without any fuss on her part, she hides the Israelite spies and asks them if they will protect her and her family when they actually do take the city. And so after this amazing event of circling the city, blowing the trumpets, the priests dress in their priestly robes, the Ark of the Covenant going before them, the city falls, and the Israelites keep their promise to her. Now, as a woman, it's really meaningful to me that uh, Rahab is listed both as a harlot and she is listed in Christ's genealogy in Matthew 5. In Beautiful. fact, interestingly enough, five women are listed by Matthew. And I want to backtrack just a moment and remind everyone that one thing Matthew is known for is he's always wanting to point out prophecy. He will throughout his record say, and thus it was fulfilled the words of the prophet Isaiah and so forth, is that Matthew's really an Old Testament lover. And he really wants to help us to understand the divinity of Jesus as an eternal being and as God. So how interesting that of all the different accounts and record keepers, it's Matthew that includes the five women, each of them with a questionable background. The first being Tamar, who was Judah's daughter-in-law. And then we have Rahab, who ended up marrying Salmon from the tribe of Judah. And it's recorded that she's the mother of Boaz. And I'm thinking, if not the mother, perhaps the ancestress, but but thinking about Boaz, who is also stands in as a type of a Gaol or a redeemer in, in what he does for Ruth. So we have Tamar, we have Rahab, we have Ruth, we have Bathsheba, who David stole away from her husband, and then we have Mary, all of them who history has recorded with questionable reputations. And yet the Lord names them and, and holds them as his beloved ancestors, those mm -hmm. who have gone before. Been redeemed. Yes. Yeah. yeah. They're yeah. redeemed. We don't have very many stories of women in the scriptures. And a lot of times we have a hard time interpreting them. But I think, it, I think that I would put Rahab in the same classification of the woman of the well. The woman of the well, we all are quick to call a sinner because she's had five husbands. The person she's married to now, or the person she's living with, she's not married to. But as Richard Holzoffel, one of my favorite BYU professors points out, we have to look at the tradition and culture of the time as we jump to all these conclusions. Because for, in, for instance, we don't know this, her story, but it helps us to learn about the importance of not judging and being critical is that if a woman were barren and she was considered barren, if she could not have a male child, if a woman were barren in those days, a man could clap his hands three times and say, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you. And so Brother Holzoffel posits, what if the woman at the well were barren? And there were five different men who took a chance on her. And then as a woman in those days, she couldn't have her own business and you know, she, women are com were completely dependent upon men for their livelihood. And, and there was property. Yeah. Exactly, their property. And so she, there was a man who was willing to take her in. And again, so it always breaks my heart when people say, oh, she's an adulteress and so forth, because we honestly don't know. What we do know is that the Savior saw her and, I mean, really saw her. And in fact, told his disciples on that day, I must needs go through Samaria because that's not the way that they would typically make that journey. He's waiting for the well, waiting at the well for her at noonday, hottest part of the day. Nobody goes to the well then. She's an outcast and he's waiting for her. And I I can't help but link Rahab and the woman of the well together. So that there's so little we know when we when we put a, you know, a title on someone like a harlot or an adulteress. But the Lord knows. And Rahab was saved and became part of the Lord's own family. I think the well saved so many others, pointed so many others to Christ. Yeah. Yeah, he does that. He it's it's back to this example of he, he's in that dark valley, he's in that painful point and lifts and brings light. I love that. See, that's the kind of those are I I didn't I didn't know that about the woman at the well. I didn't I, I didn't know that it was at noon, but it makes sense. I mean that she would be an outcast, that she would be she'd be avoiding people. And and the Lord cuts through that judgment, that self-judgment, that self. Uh, yep. condemnation it's beautiful and <clears throat> he invites us to come to him and receive all of the blessings 
that he has in store for us. Speaking of blessings, and I know our time is short, let's go ahead and talk about Joshua fulfilling the commandment Mm. that first of all, Moses had received from the Lord, that as they go into the promised land, six of the tribes are to stand on one mountain, Mount Ebal, and six are to stand near the other mountain, Mount Gerizim, as they travel through the valley. And there are appointed leaders from each tribe, six on one, six on the other, that shout out as the Israelites go through the valley, either blessings for keeping the covenant, all the promises the Lord has made if you keep the covenant, and consequences, or they call them curses, if you break the covenant. And a lot of people don't recognize how in the ancient world, whenever someone made a covenant, it was explained in detail to them. Here are the promised blessings, but here are severe consequences if you don't keep the covenant. And I think that today, I think we've sort of tried to polish things up. In fact, we had someone uh, write on write a, a comment on our uh, podcast that when uh, we quoted the scriptures as saying that Moses wasn't allowed to go into the promised land because he'd struck the rock and uh, said, I gave you water. Someone had written under that, that God was not petty and that we had, we had misconstrued that. And so we're living in a, we're living in, I just viewed it as petty. I just viewed it as consequence. (laughs) We're living in a time when people are convinced that God is all generous, all merciful, but we have to remember, first of all, Joseph Smith told us that in order to have faith necessary unto salvation, we needed to have a correct idea of God's nature and attributes. And God himself tells us his nature and attributes. So we should believe him when he tells us. And in the book of Exodus, in the book of, in the books of the old Testament, God describes himself as being angry. And by the way, he does in the doctrine and covenants as well, which is interesting to me because people will so often say, I don't want to read the old Testament. That's a different God, but certainly even in the very first, first section of the doctrine and covenants, the Lord describes about that we are having strong consequences coming on us for breaking covenants. And the truth is it's only fair, just, and merciful to tell us if you do this, this will happen. And if you do this, this will happen. It's back to the game, right? Us cheering in the stands. What are you cheering for if there's no rules? What are you cheering for if there's no fouls or there's there's no way to earn points? Right? There there have to there has to be rules. There has to be law. And and law is like it's funny. Like, for example, the law of gravity, right? Unless you have the law of gravity, you can't fly. Mm-hmm. And there, there are people that will curse that law and say, ah, you know, or, or God's laws that feel like gravity, that, are, that feel like they're designed to keep us down, but they're actually designed to, to help us soar. They're, right. they're designed to help us rise up to his level. And unless we obey them, it's, it, you, that's interesting. I didn't know that someone had made that comment. It's too bad too, because I think sometimes we, and we all do it for ourselves, right? We, we excuse our, our indiscretions, um, speeding. I have a habit of driving quickly sometimes <laughs> when I'm trying to get to something or, you know, uh, maybe saying, oh, it's not that big of a deal if I don't brush my kid's teeth one night, <laughs> stuff like that. But the reality is there's still a consequence. You're still going to get a cavity if you don't brush your teeth. And so it, you know, it's, it's, we, we're, we're here to learn that we're here to learn the cause and effect. We're here to learn the opposition and God would not be a loving God. If he just, if he just told us not to worry about the consequences, parents who tell their kids, eh, it's okay. You don't have to go to church and eh, it's okay. You, you don't have to read your scriptures and create excuses for their kids damaged and cripple their kids. Yeah. We, we have to see the reality. It's true. And I also have been trying to point out to my friends and classes lately that the consequences are truly, honestly merciful. So for example, when we get to a certain point, we will see that the Israelites are scattered. And there are so many that have said, this was a great blessing to all the world, because this is the way that Abraham's seed went to all of the world. Even when we go back to Mount Sinai and the Lord is angry because of the golden calf and they lose the Melchizedek priesthood, well, they receive the Aaronic priesthood which had the ministering of angels, which basically the Lord's saying, okay, you're not ready to be in my presence yet, even though I invited you to, but I, I'm not turning my back on you. I'm going to give you an angel to lead you is what we read in the book of Exodus, which is under the, the ministration of the Aaronic priesthood. In addition, then he provides the tabernacle and the temple, 
You guys weren't ready yet to come directly into my presence on the mountain. Here's a way you can practice. And so we really need to have a deeper understanding. Number one, as you've mentioned, so that we can be better parents. But we need to have a, a deeper understanding of what it means to make a covenant and how we have blessings and or consequences. Father Lehi was very clear about that. And we don't seem to be offended that when he was describing what would happen on this promised land, yeah. for those who would keep the commandments, we'll be blessed and prosper. But the minute we start electing uh, political leaders that are false and aren't following God, what did Lehi tell us? We'll be swept off the land. Well, and we'll have all kinds of trouble. And then so many others after Lehi repeated that. So that is a typical sort of blessing, laying out a covenant with its blessing and its consequences so that we can say when we're making a choice, okay, I made this choice knowingly. Love and I think it's important to recognize, to kind of bring it back to this dark valley, he's in the dark valley and at the peak. It's important to remember that the, the chastisement or the cursing, like even the cursing that was given to Adam and Eve was meant to be an invitation back. It was meant to be a blessing. But if you take it deeper, you recognize that Christ is paying for that. That's right. he, he's there with us. Exactly. He's feeling the weight of it. He's atoning for it. He's, he's sweating blood over it. And he's saying, I will heal you. I'm, I'm here with you in this pain to help you choose, to help you choose whether you're going to serve me or whether you're going to, you're going to serve destruction yeah tell us is, about that tell, because that's joshua's final counsel right take, i love it I, there. Yeah, yeah take us there well you know it's the one thing that in all my years back back in the day when i was a seminary student it's the one thing that i associated with joshua is that he he issues this declaration he says choose ye this day whom you will serve as for me and my house we will serve the lord and that that to me that is again it's iconic of joshua he's saying you we're here to choose we're here to choose who we serve. We're here to choose who we become. We're here to choose and that, that agency that we fought a war over in heaven. That, that, that's the reason we're here is to have these, these oppositional experiences and choose. It's, it's the grand invitation of all time. It's, it's the same invitation that Enoch gave to the people. He said, hey, choose, predating Joshua in many respects and Joshua echoing it. You get to choose the God of heaven or you get to, or you get to choose your own selfish destruction. <laughs> and I, I've often wondered about this. <clears throat> is this some like type because intellectually it's easy to go well, that sounds like a grand manipulation <laughs> it's like either you choose god and it's great or you don't choose god and it's awful and i, I it's funny because in we have to remember this is just act two of a three-act play to borrow i think it's boy k packer who uses yeah. that analogy right yeah so and we have this existence before act one and in the law we have this idea of informed consent this idea that you can't really do something to somebody that violates their agency or or potentially risks or harms them unless they understand what they're agreeing to, like you were saying about the covenants, here's the consequences, you know, the, the bumpers <laughs> on the bowling lane that we're trying to go down. And if you think about the fact that we were up in heaven and we said, yes, we want to follow Christ. Yes, we want to have experiences that help us become like him. Yes, we want to understand what it's like to be more like our heavenly parents. Yes, we want to gain the glory and the light and the power and the empathy and the compassion and the charity that you have that elevates you and makes you God, then of course, us coming down here, I, we've already agreed to go through this. I believe we set it up this way with God, that that's yeah. part of our agency that we said, yeah, I may stray a little bit. Can you help me out by reminding me and by letting me bump into the pain to wake me back up by letting me understand that there's a, a, a boundary there and there's consequence so that I wake back up and come back in to the light or come back up the mountain. I, I think we wanted that. Yeah, I don't I know. Agree. What do you think about that? <laughs> oh, I, com I completely agree. I, I feel uh, quite certain of it. In, in particular, I think our patriarchal blessings, when we uh, read our patriarchal blessings and we ponder the fact that we're eternal beings, I think that we can kind of part the veil a little bit and have that sense of that we were in a perfect accord with our father in heaven, as we talked about our life assignments. And I totally agree with you that we, we not only ask for sort of the memorial type of stones, be it your wedding ring or the altars that Joshua built and memorials and so forth. We either ask, we asked for that, but I think we did also ask, give me a heads up, hard stop warning when I'm going the wrong way. And I think we receive those, you know, I really do. And in fact, 
it's really illustrated, I believe, so much here with Joshua because he tells them, you know, what the Lord has warned us about over and over is we're going into a land where there's a lot of other gods. And you've got to choose. You're either going to follow the Lord or you're going to get assimilated in this. And if you get assimilated, people, we're going to get scattered. I mean, it's it's just so incredible, the detail of the prophecies, and then to see the prophecies end up being fulfilled as they are. And he's just spelling it out just as clearly as I believe that the Lord has spelled out to us the plan of salvation. And again, it had to come a little bit easier for Joshua because he was studying the scriptures day and night. And I think that when we study the scriptures, we see the plan of salvation laid out for us. And one of my favorite chapters is, I think it's Isaiah 40, where the Lord says, have you not known? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? And, and he really has. I mean, really from the beginning, the Lord tells us everything, including up to the millennial day. He tells us everything. And so we can't say we didn't know, <laughs> but what a blessing and true lifeline it is to us to have the scriptures and the word of God. And then today to add to that, to follow the instructions or the pleadings of President Nelson, who asked us to have the spirit in our own lives and learn how to hear him so that we have the gift of the scriptures, but the spirit can help us to know how those scriptures apply to us today and, and, and can lead and direct us today. I would just want to bear my testimony to that, that I know that that is so true that the Lord has blessed us just like the Israelites, <clears throat> excuse me, had this promise of the promised land and the Lord took them there. We also have the promise of a promised land. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm getting too emotional. That promised land is, is exaltation in his kingdom and living with him and living with our families forever. And he's promised us, here's the way to go. Now, are you going to murmur in the wilderness? Uh, can we take a straight path to the promised land? What will be our parting of the Red Sea or the Jordan River? What will we need to cut away from our hearts in order to be fully engaged and receive this abundance in the promised land that the Lord has? has Virtual reality or a simulation. And it's funny because in many respects we are, but there are consequences. Mm -hmm. And so that's why the Lord's lovingly inviting us to, yeah. to choose him. So thank you for the time today. I love oh, that. Thank you, Sam. I always enjoy our time together. And as always, we invite our viewers to leave comments and questions. And I do want to just say again, for, the, for those who did leave the comments about Moses held out before us. And as you said, plan A, plan B, plan C, all are Jesus Christ. I love that. Under that. <laughs> And I'm grateful that he's in every experience. I found every experience is a gift. Every experience is an invitation to remember him, to choose him, and to serve him, and to become like him. That's, that's the most beautiful thing about this, this earth, earth experience. You know, in, in the world today, there's all these uh, tech people that are talking about how we're living in a, in a... That That is, we can find that really easily online in the Old Testament student manual for the institute manuals that that, that is the case. But I hope that our conversation has strengthened others and, and helped to hold out great hope and peace in Christ. And again, thank you for viewing and be sure and like and share. And thank you, Sam. Thank you.